And did this go live or is this recording? It'll be live. Okay. Just tell me when you're ready. I love this whole Zoom situation on live. It's amazing. All right, I think it's- ooh. It says it's streaming on Facebook now. Oh, perfect. There you go. I'm gonna tag you in it. It'll be live. Okay. Just tell me when you're ready. A Zoom situation on live. It's amazing. I hear a voice, but I don't see a person. It's right, it's me. I'm watching the live. Streaming on Facebook. Hold on. I'm I'm, wa I'm watching the live. I'm, Who's happening? What's happening? <laughs> I just wanted to be able to um to tag you in it. Why didn't I, why didn't I do this the first time? I don't know. Okay. All righty, we will go ahead and get started. Let's uh, share this, bada bing, bada boom. All right, all right, all right, all right. Welcome, Sarah, <laughs> to Facebook Live with Young Black Equestrians. How are you doing today? I'm great. My book that I've been working on for years comes out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Horse crazy. Yes. The story of a woman in a world in love with an animal. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm freaking out. I bet and you. I'm so happy to be sitting down with you. I've, I've uh, been been hitting you up for a while before I know uh, this book was even a thing so thanks for having me yes 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 um let's go ahead and get started since we are already on here um so tell us what even prompted you to write this book well I've always kept so I'm a reporter for the New York Times. That's my day job. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always kept the fact that I'm actually a secret horse nut totally on the DL because I was afraid I wouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, riding is this elite world. Uh, it's sort of seen as out of touch. And it is, right? It's this rarefied, you know, uh, lily white thing. And I cover really uh, hard scrabble, dark corners of the world. I'm an investigative reporter. Um, I cover murders, crime, uh, terrorism in West Africa. And I was worried people wouldn't take me seriously. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, I had a really like low time at work. There's like nothing to do. And I was on Facebook all day and I was moaning that I'm just like rotting in my chair. And he was like, right, like write a book or something. And I was like, the only thing I care about is horses. And he said to me, really smart words, he said, um, it's about passion. He's like, passion mm -hmm. resonates with people. It doesn't matter what it is. This mm -hmm. is your passion and that's what they'll hear, you know, and they won't uh, denigrate you for being in, like ponies. Uh, so I did. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a ding. Did we get Galen here? No, that okay. was oh. it's being crazy. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a book about passion. Mm -hmm. Well, that is cool. That is cool. I So you didn't grow up on horseback. You didn't grow up riding or as an equestrian or anything like that. Oh, no, I'm from New York City. Uh, <laughs> I am the daughter of uh, two Jews, a Holocaust survivor and immigrant, um, and uh, New York City born and raised, my mom. And horses are totally foreign to them. And actually, I was just talking about this, because I did an interview for a Jewish magazine called The Forward, a Jewish newspaper, talking about how I always felt like I was uh, interloping in a world that wasn't my own. Mm -hmm. That equestrian sport is this waspy, super white thing. And look, I can pass because of my skin color, but you know, I'm an immigrant uh, with a dad with an accent and I bring kosher turkey meat to uh, you know, school lunch. And I always felt like I was an outsider. And uh, my dad used to say, you know, Ralph Lauren, who created this cashmere and jod for his world of equestrian sport, mm -hmm. his real name is Ralphie Lipschitz. Wow. And 
Ralph Lauren is a Jew from Queens, mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, it's interesting what people project about who, who horses belong to. And mm -hmm. in interviewing Monty Roberts, you know, the truth is uh, horses are democratic. Horses don't know that they're all wrapped up with wealth and elite. Uh, they just care that you're a safe place to be. Um, mm -hmm. But the, a lot of the book is unpacking this sense of being an outsider in a world that didn't belong to me. Yeah, yeah. And we can definitely resonate with that uh, here on the podcast and kind of in the community that we've developed around it. Because yeah. that's, you know, everyone has different experiences, but that is like the overarching theme of the experiences of the people that we talk to, you know, trying to break, break in to this this world where they don't see people that look like them it's just an experience that not only black people have to have yeah and that's why it's uh so i guess irritating to me when people say like black people don't ride horses because they can't afford it and i'm like that is not the only barrier to yeah. Exactly. Rich world. black people, you don't see them riding either. You know? Right, right. You know, it is something else. So instead of using that as a, a cop out, because that's an easy answer that you don't have to think about and you can just put dollar signs like, no, that's not the only answer. And there's no there's no culpability in that of the community at large, right? It's factors beyond our control. You know, it's money and right. society's fucked up. Well, first of all, it's fucked up that wealth does fall along racial lines in this country, which mm -hmm. is uh, part of the systemic injustice that we're all working to uh, fix. And thankfully, the country's getting a little bit woke right now. It's about time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, but it, it it takes away culpability. I worked at a ranch. One of my um, chapters in the book is about uh, working as a ranch hand, actually in Montauk in the Hamptons, which you wouldn't expect there's a ranch, but if you think about it, um, the cowboys who came uh, west started east. So the oldest ranch in America is in the Hamptons, actually. Wow. And I worked there as a ranch hand. And in researching the book, I wanted to find out about the history of it. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders uh, stabled there. And uh, it, I think the first ever cowboy was, American cowboy was there. And I'm looking at a pamphlet from 1930 at the ranch I worked at. And it says, you know, five cents a trail ride, you know, cowboy cookout, 50 cents and then it says the clientele is restricted to gentiles and that's not that long ago yeah and it's a world where a stamp like that was okay mm -hmm. you know where uh there's a separate a color drinking fountain and colored swimming pool and the client is restricted to gentiles and if we don't dig into our sport and figure out and remember that it actively excluded people like you, people like me, then we're never going to improve. Right. Right. Yeah. We got heavy real quick. I, <laughs> I'm telling you, I make a joke that this is the first woke horse book. <laughs> yeah. This isn't a book about, about girls who love ponies because all of us are deeper than that and better than that. And it, it's, it's a, it's a real exploration of what this sport means to people. Right, 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 right. Um, so what is one of the most surprising things that you learned uh, on this journey as an author? Hello. Hi. Hi. Her audio is connecting. Hey. Hello. There you go. <laughs> so Sarah was just telling us about um, like horse crazy the book is not about little girls that love ponies and we're like my little pony out here and running around <laughs> pretending they're like a unicorn <laughs> i mean we've done that we all right know. right i'm just like but the whole book is not about that which i am thankful about um but first a woke horse book is yeah uh, that's my joke it's the first <laughs> horse book <laughs> Because, you know, it's about identity. I, I'll just repeat myself a tiny bit. You know, I'm the daughter of a Holocaust survivor and an immigrant, and I always felt like I was um, sneaking into this world that wasn't for me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, uh, but I can pass because of my skin color, right? Like nobody, uh, uh, visually, I looked the part, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, historically I'm not. And it was a big push and pull through my whole identity. And really the realization is that 
you know, horses don't give a shit, you know, <laughs> and, and that, that's what matters. Yeah. Um, you were just asking the, one of the most surprising things uh, mm -hmm. I learned in the book. Well, I'll just tell you a story because we got, we got heavy really quick. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an investigative reporter. I only operate on one level. Uh, Goodness. But let's lighten it up. So I went to India. Um, before I became an investigative reporter, I was, um, believe it or not, a spa reporter. My job was to go around the world and get massage. And it was insane. So <laughs> why did you switch for, uh, right. for like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Actually, because I realized it was a life that was only about making me feel good. And that felt, it didn't feel enough. You know, I was saying like, the only thing that like my work fixed was sun damage, you know, and, and like, it just, it's not how I was raised, but it was, it was fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I went to India and I rode this unbelievable horse. It's actually the horse that's on the cover of the book. This is the mm -hmm. book. It's mm -hmm. called a Marwari horse. And they're big like thoroughbreds and fleet like Arabians but they have these curly cute ears. They meet yeah. in a heart at the top of yeah. their head. Mm -hmm. So cute. And I came back and I was like, I gotta get a Marwari. I was like, I don't know what happens. I need this thing. It's like a Dr. Seuss creature. <laughs> so I'm like going nuts, Googling how to get a Marwari. I'm like, I don't care, life savings, Marwari. And turns out you can't export them. Uh, the Indian government considers them a rare commodity and uh, a precious commodity and won't let them be exported. And yet there is one lady with 12 of them in Martha's Vineyard. And I'm like, oh wow, that's random. Wow. Happened. <laughs> so I call her up and I'm like, can we talk? She's like, come to my island paradise. Awesome. Yeah. And she speaks like that. So I spent the week with her. Turns out uh, she's this posh British lady. She's been I mean, I could tell you the whole story, but it, it'll take forever. Uh, she's been intimately involved with these horses uh, in India. And she's the reason they locked down exporting them because she took a bunch and sold them for a fortune. And then everybody tried to sell their mm. warriors. And also the Indian government was like, who's this colonialist bitch who's coming and, you know, again, stealing our yeah. resources, you yep. know? So he's yeah. always in there. Anyway, but I'm like, okay, cool, I get it. But how do you have these horses, specifically this exact horse that I rode into Cape Pogue Bay, a mm -hmm. uh, stallion called Nazrana. And she's like, uh, she says to me, you come up with tremendous adventure when you engage in tremendous duplicity. Literally what she said. And turns out she's been smuggling semen from India in her pocket to create this illicit herd in America. She is officially horse crazy. Um, yeah, because horse semen does not live like it doesn't like to just live in any condition. Like that shit is sensitive. Yeah, but also like Where in the world. <laughs> in, in, the, in your pot. I love that's the first thing you think you're like, I'm a I'm pre vet, that's not how it would work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this woman is insane. Does she have it in extender. That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow she did it right, and there were like two Marwaris that got out before the ban, and now there are 12 little Marwaris in her island paradise. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. I mean, not that it was like the right thing, but it's just like, wow. That's she how dedicated people, people are to stealing other people's resources. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow. Right? Exactly. She's like, this is my continent, manifest destiny. Ugh. <laughs> I will tell you a twist to that. Right. So we'll call her, you know, colonialist tropes of, you know, stealing from the Indian subcontinent. I mean, like the English did tea, right? Tea's not even from England. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I spent the week with her. Right. And I'm, by the end, I'm like, so you told me like the what, you know, about the horses. You told me the how, the smuggling. But there's no why here. Like why for 25 years has Francesca Kelly, this British, essentially noble woman, socialite, become the steward of the Marwari horse. Like, why you? And then she reveals that the truth is she's gone back to India five times a year, every year for 20 years, not to check on her horses, but to bang the safari guide she met on the first trip. And she's had a love affair that has spanned her marriage uh, for 20 years. And the horses just got wrapped up in it. Now you want to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Mic yes. drop. <laughs> okay. 
okay. There's the always okay. It started with semen and then it backed up. Backed right. up it starts and ends with semen, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. All right. That's, of course, it has something to do with a man. <laughs> right. Of course, ruin everything. <laughs> Oh my God, this is on Facebook Live. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's okay. It's okay. We'll work it out. Oh my goodness. That is that is something that I did not expect. And uh, that was surprising. <laughs> I'll go get that book and read it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am excited to read this book. I, I mean, I was first excited because it was not about some little girl that was like, you know, floating through the clouds on a Pegasus. <laughs> um, got a little pony. But little also, girl. we get to hear about, what'd you say her name was? Francesca? Francesca Kelly, the wild <laughs> woman. Yes, yes. And I'm going to read her her portion in her voice. <laughs> how you um, impersonated her. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right, so um, the podcast is Young Black Equestrians. So you have learned so much about different people, you know, doing your, your research on, you know, in, in order to write this book, what is it that you learned about Black cowboys of Black equestrians throughout this, this writing journey? Yeah, so I have been writing since I'm two years old, mm -hmm. and it took uh, till I was, I think, 24, 23, to learn one shred about the Black equestrian experience. And that's insane. I mean, I'm from New York City. It's 25% black. You know, the the equestrian world is 0.000% black. You know, if if the world was a legit place, the equestrian world in New York City should be 25% black. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it it really took a fluke for me to learn about it. So I was bicycling alongside uh, the Harlem River um, on a day off from, I, I think I had, it was summer break from university. And uh, I was sort of just tootling around. And then I was like, that little red building on that island in the middle of the Harlem River that is shared by an insane asylum and a couple of bridge stanchions, I was like, that looks like a horse barn. And I was like, I've always you know, driven past this in a taxi or a bus. And I've always thought that kind of looks like a horse barn. And then I was like, holy shit, it is a horse barn. So I turned across this pedestrian bridge that pedaled my little legs off uh, across the river, threw my bike into a bush and ran to the barn. And uh, it was all shut up. It was little red, like charming barn. And I see just some shavings fly out the door. And I was like, well, where there's shavings and somebody picking horse crap, there are horses. <laughs> so I dive into the stall and this little old lady is like, <gasps> you know, I scare her. And uh, so this is how I met um, Mrs. Ann Blair. You have to call her Mrs. Uh, and her husband has to be called Dr. Blair, uh, the proprietor of New York City Riding Academy. And she put that pitchfork in my hand that morning and said, if you can pick a stall, uh, you can have a job. Um, actually, she put me on her uh, quarter horse mare, Brownie, in my shorts and sneakers and bicycle helmet and said, if you can ride this horse and pick a stall, you can have a job. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I picked the stall terribly because Mrs. Blair is obsessive compulsive. She picks it with like, literally like a dessert fork. That's how she <laughs> takes it the entire day. So thankfully I was never good enough uh, for, to clean the stalls. So my only job was to ride. Uh huh. But Dr. and Mrs. Blair are, uh, Black Americans, African Americans from New York, they, they call themselves uh, uh, the original cowboys. And through Dr. Blair, uh, who was the former chancellor of the New York State education system, he had retired to have this farm on Ward's Island. And he was the founder of the New York City Black Rodeo. And I had no idea that on Lenox Avenue in Harlem for 20 years, Dr. Blair had flown in the top black riders from around the world and put on an exhibition rodeo in New York City. And I didn't know any of this for the whole summer I worked for them. I just thought they were two real ornery old folks because they were. <laughs> um, and I thought that uh, it was a tiny little riding academy. And 
every day we would have a bus load of inner city children, uh, mostly black and brown children, uh, come and visit with the horses. And they would pet them and they would ask questions and Dr. Blair would scream at them because like I said, real ornery. And um, I one day was washing Brownie and he would sit in this folding chair throne with his cowboy hat on while Mrs. Blair, you know, panned for gold in the stalls. And I said to him, Dr. Blair, can I ask you a question? And he said, you know, shocked I addressed him because like I said, he's a scary dude. And he was like, yes, Sarah. And I was like, um, why don't we teach riding here? You know, we have 40 kids come a day. We have three horses. All we ever do is they pet the horse. I show them, you know, trot, canter. And, and as a white person, you know, uh, on these horses in front of these very impoverished children who had never seen a horse in their lives, I, I felt like I was just demonstrating my privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, what, what, am, what are we showing here? And Dr. Blair said, do you know what a cowboy is, Sarah? And I thought it was a rhetorical question because don't we all, you know? And he said, uh, a cowboy is a black man. And Dr. Blair taught me about the origins of the word cowboy, which you may have heard, that even the word cowboy, and some people are, you know, historians are questionable about this, but uh, that in the era when the word cowboy was coined in the probably late 1700s, you wouldn't call a white man a boy. That would be denigrating. You would call a black man a slave, a boy, you know, a house boy, a chore boy. Um, and so Dr. Blair believes that the word, even the word cowboy indicates that it was a profession by black men, by black slaves. And working for him opened my eyes tremendously um, to what I wasn't seeing. You know, we're the black people that were missing from the equestrian story. And so then in reporting my book, which takes threads of my life and unravels them. So my story working for Dr. Blair is a personal story of just a kind of hilarious job I had as a kid, um, riding in bike shorts in, in circles under the city skyline um, for these crazy old folks, became uh, the impetus for me to explore the a really erased legacy of the black cowboy. Should I keep going in this track? I feel like I'm feeling on. No, no, keep it, keep going. This yeah. is yeah. Uh, so I reach. Well, I'm out taking notes, like I, me I, too. <laughs> so I reach out to this historian, William Lauren Katz, um, actually another Jewish uh, person from New York City, and he's become the foremost uh, scholar on the omissions from the historical record of black and brown people. Um, his father was obsessed with jazz growing up in the 1930s. And he would listen as a little boy to this amazing music. And he wanted to write a histo history of jazz because he, you know, jazz wasn't taken seriously as an art form that art form them because it was done by black people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so he wanted to write a history of jazz. And in writing the history of jazz, he started speaking to poets. And the poet Langston Hughes called him on his phone in 1946 in his apartment in the West Village. And Langston Hughes was this luminary of the Harlem Renaissance. And he said to him, don't forget the cowboys. And Langston Hughes traced his history back to Buffalo Soldiers. And that made William Lauren Katz write a whole book about the Black West. And William Lauren Katz, this Jewish boy from New York, became the foremost scholar of Black cowboys. Wow. And I think that that relates to my people, my father, the Holocaust survivor, and people literally tried to erase my people from not just history, from this planet. Yeah. And for me, the cause of writing people back into history where they belong is my own cause, even if those people don't look like me. And I think that was William Katz's cause. And, and he died this year. Um, I mean, he was a cool fucking dude. Um, I'm going to try to find this uh, poem, Langston Hughes poem I have in the book. Um, but Kat set me on this journey to really tell the story of the black cowboy. Mm -hmm. um, because if one person is erased from the story, we're all erased, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Who's, who's next? That's how I think. Hold on. Talk amongst yourself while I find this story. <laughs> well, we had that book in our library. Um... Oh, the Black West? Yes. <laughs> oh, cool. Oh, I love that guy. He was such a, just a good heart. Yeah. He just died this year. But I didn't know that about um, 
about the poetry and that really speaks to me because I like to write poetry so mm. that is amazing. Yeah I mean it bridges people's stories you know that just I'd love to read your poetry sometime. Mm -hmm. um, okay so the poet Langston Hughes wrote in his 1942 poem merry-go-round where is the Jim Crow section on this merry-go-round mister because I want to ride on the bus we're put in the back but there ain't no back to a merry-go-round Where's the horse for a kid that's black? And that's just a painful, painful poem, you know? And the omission of black cowboys, which one in four cowboys were black in the American West. And the West was integrated because life was just too goddamn hard out there to keep the same distances everybody needed to help out. Right. Um, and so in exploring the black cowboys, uh, for the book after uh, Kat set me on this uh, journey, I went to Rosenberg, Texas to the museum of the, or the Black Cowboy Museum mm -hmm. where I met a postman called Larry Callis. And uh, he used to be a country singer and then his voice disappeared suddenly and destroyed his country singing uh, career, which Larry doesn't mind one bit because it allowed him more time to be a cowboy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Larry, uh, used his life savings to create this museum. And it's really just one room and it, it's kind of like a little shrine to the cowboys that are really enshrined nowhere else. Um, but the thing is, Larry's cousins, you know, his bronc busting cousin Tex, one of the best in, in Texas youth history, he's not in any rodeo halls of fame because he wasn't allowed to compete in their rodeos. Mm -hmm. So the white people could compete in his rodeo, but he couldn't come. If you can't compete, you can't compete. Right. And so Larry took it upon himself to create this museum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, went, we went and rode around, uh, tried some horses. Um, he bought himself this ancient 22 year old horse when I was with him. And I was like, Larry, they only live till like 28, don't buy a 22 year old. <laughs> it was cheap. And I was like, it's cheap for a reason. <laughs> um, oh. yeah. uh, but you know it was it was really it was really powerful being with him um you know bill bill pickett uh the inventor of the rodeo sport of bulldogging which you see everywhere you know wrestling a cow to the ground um was a black man and he was only inducted in the cowboy hall of, hall of fame in 1989 its first black inductee what there weren't black cowboys before 1989 Right. The guy died in 1918 or something, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it when and this circles back to what you say about um, the, the trope of, oh, uh, it's about wealth and, and black people don't have the money to compete. You know, what are the reasons that that black people are not, you know, at the table? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you, they've been excluded uh, and, and disenfranchised. How can you expect them to be in the show jumping arena? You know, and and uh, we, before you got on the the, the line, Kaylin, we were talking about that saying it's just about money is uh, absolving people of culpability. Mm -hmm. so, I want to read you one beautiful thing that Larry said to me. I won't read it in his squeaky voice because it sounds like a, a barn door. <laughs> it's fitting. Yeah. yeah, he hated that I put that in the book. I was like, Blair, you can't, his voice is, it's a big thing. <laughs> but he's good humored about it. That's really interesting. I re That's like bucket list for us to go down there and yeah. visit. Definitely. The I love Larry, but it, it, his museum, it, you know, it's like a dude's attic. Like, it, it, he needs to step up his collection a little. Larry, if you're listening. <laughs> Larry, we're gonna meet you. You know, we can help you find some artifacts. Yes, something help you curate. He needs a little help with curating, but he's a postman. You know, like he's and and what's so beautiful about it is that this is his best effort, and it's important enough that he did it. You know, yeah. he's an inspiration. Yeah, yeah, that's like how I feel with this podcast. Yes, like, this that's why I was like, please have me on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay he said um actually this is just what i meant I, I said you know it looks like a kind of an attic -y type place i said but i couldn't begrudge the little museum its lack of rigor callus is a mailman not a historian a cowboy not a curator 
he had taken his history into his own hands. I didn't want these cowboys to have lived in vain, Callis said, pointing to an antique photo of seven black men on horses from 1800 who had started it all. He found this photo and that's what made him realize that black people were part of the story. Um, he said, this is why I opened this museum because black cowboys meant something and they meant something to me. Oh, I, I just wow. <laughs> but you know, I've been researching further and, and you probably know this. Um, I, uh, I, I wish I'd included this in the book. I didn't talk about horse racing. You know, the first winner of the Kentucky Derby was a black man and the horse was trained by a, fr a freed slave who had been purchased in order to train horses. I mean, look, you're nodding, you know this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, slave owners, horse owners ran the horses they owned with the humans on top of them in the early days of racing. And you walk around a plantation, right? And you feel chills. Like everyone, you walk on a plantation and you know that horror happened there. Mm -hmm. And when I go to a plantation wedding, I, I have goosebumps. Like, I, you know, it's just like, you feel it. But has anybody ever asked a race barn to pay reparations? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're changing Washington and Lee University. You know, what about uh, those race barns that, you know, starved their jockeys so they'd maintain weight? You know, and, and they're just so much we have to unpack and there's so much that is owed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in front of Churchill Downs, I was just looking at it, uh, where the Kentucky Derby is run, Secretariat's statue is there in bronze and his rider on top of him. And then there's Aristides, the first horse that won the Derby. No rider on his back. As if that horse won that Derby and trained right. himself. Right. Where is Aristides' rider? Erased from history. Yeah. Sorry, I told you only have one setting. It's <laughs> It's the truth, you know. Yeah, it is the truth. It and it's is. like, okay, so well, how do we make them go ahead and um get the mold for that statue and just throw him up there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, he should be up there with with every rider behind him that was erased. Mm -hmm. Every person who their horse was under a whip and a spur, and so were they. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. yeah yeah and i i think like as far as the the record of history it's not even only omission that is you know the issue i know like some of the um the western tv shows movie or tv shows like they they crafted this character around a black cowboy mm -hmm. i'm I can't remember the exact Lone Ranger. Yeah, I think it was him. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's just like, you know, even in Hollywood, you know, it's it's not that you just say, okay, we're not gonna include the black people, let's just ignore them. But no, it's like I see you. I see you and I am gonna take from you mm -hmm. and put this out to benefit myself. And that's history is written by the victors right that saying right so think about who wrote the stories who wrote the movies you know uh, and, and and william lauren katz says it if uh if americans admitted to the prevalence of black people in the origin story of the american west which is our origin story right like something about the pioneer thing that's like who like, I'm the daughter of immigrant Jews from New York City and the origin story of America is mine, the wild and free West, right? It's all of ours. Mm -hmm. um, if they admitted that this narrative of what makes the best of us, what makes us American, that some of the people in that narrative came at the end of a whip and in chains, that's not the history America wants to remember. And right. that's what Kat says, why, why they were removed. Mm -hmm. and, and it just really sucks because it's like, well, you don't want to remember that, but it's what got us here. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And now that we're like looking back, it's, you know, people today, majority of people we can say are, um, you know, like if they descend from people that own slaves, they're like, oh, I'm totally, you know, denouncing that part of my history. You know, I don't want anything to do. I know my family owns slaves, yada, yada, yada. I'm not like, I'm not talking to that side of the family. And it's like, okay, like I understand, but they might have the key to the history of some black people that you don't even know, you know? 
they may they may hold they hold those stories they hold those records they hope you know it's it's kind of like a catch-22 but you know in in moving forward we kind of also have to move back and like find ourselves and that teaches us where to go in the future and for a lot of people of color there is no record you know there or they you get you go back to a certain time and it's like nothing well the the um the guy who won uh, his name is escaping me um uh, on Aristides uh, of course I remember the horse because I'm a horse nut right we all remember like the horse we first rode when we were 12 but I don't remember people I met at a party um but uh the uh, he's buried in a barely marked grave with a ton of other black jockeys in you know uh Louisville Cemetery number two and nobody knows anything about him he was the biggest sports star of his time you know everybody knows about Babe Ruth mm -hmm. You know, so Secretariat's groom just got a tomb or just got his tombstone done. I'm pretty sure that's who that was. I shared huh. it on the page. Mm -hmm. But um Eddie, that was his name. Yeah. Oh, there's like a, a all these pictures of them together, right? They had this like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, wow, you know, you know, applauding the effort, but it's sad. Yeah. It's like AQHA, you know, I found um, the, the, I guess the record of horses who were named the N-word way, way back when. And so when I contacted them, I was like, hey, can y'all just change this? And it upset people, but AQHA, you know, the person I was in contact with, they were like, this should have never made it this far. Cause at some point someone had to type that in for their system. I heard about that. That was you who started that? Yeah. So oh God, bravo. that's amazing. That's yeah. Oh. Wow. Doing the work. Okay. Doing the work. Nails. <laughs> okay. Wow. So they changed it, but I also asked, could you find some history? Like what if, you know, they did that because the people who took care of the horses were slaves and they just were like, well, we're just going to put this, you know, this is one of our prized horses, but we're not going to put your name on it. Yeah. you know because it would be great to find those names yeah that's a great idea wow wow oh i love that i might do it can we <laughs> collaborate on it uh, you, you put the little investigative reporter be in my bonnet yeah <laughs> because i i would love to figure that out and yeah. then i turn around and make name my horse black lives matter <laughs> are you going to I already did you did <laughs> <on> papers yeah <laughs> so good that's so good. Um, you know, a, a man, is it Amanda Steed? No, it's a different, uh, again, names. Again, I remember, don't remember people names. Uh, this um, big, Kelly Farmer, I think, uh, big hunter rider last year named her horse all Me Too names. So there's consent and like, uh, yeah, wow. Me Too. And uh, there, there are a couple others, you know, I thought it, but I love that there's a, a Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. So good. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's really interesting to me today, I think eventing, um, and I might have this a little bit wrong because I didn't read the full story. Um, don't, a reporter shouldn't admit that, but uh, eventing announced a, a scholarship program, an incentive program for minority riders, which like, where has that been? You know, like, you don't love it? So, 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 <laughs> so is great. Thank you. Okay. You know, good job. Um, I just, and I commented on this um, in our YBE group because we know several of the people that received the scholarship. Oh, they already give it out? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, apparently like they had to extend the deadline because they didn't have very many entries, yada, yada, yada. Um, in the end, there were 27 applicants. 27 applicants received $200. Stop it. That, <laughs> it's just $200? So I was I like- buy you a, a, a bridal. What the hell? Some gas bunny that's in that's a snack. <laughs> Okay. Can we rewind what I just said? And I, let me start. <laughs> Inventing had this bullshit scholarship uh, that they created. No, 
Which I, I like, I get, like, thank you for the initiative because a lot of places have not Stop been, it. but. No, because that's not an initiative. It right. When there's some substance behind it, that is just PR. Also, why do they accept 27? Let them accept two awesome riders and really big them up. Right. Yeah. And, and, and my, my uh, position on that is like, I, I feel like that's more hand outy. Of course, mm -hmm. an outrage. Black, black people are not asking to not be held at the same level of merit. Like, right. yes, this is a competition. Like, I yeah. want to, I want to show. I, you know, I want to, to explain to you why I deserve this, and that you, you know, everybody wants to say money's the only barrier. Okay, but what's two hundred dollars gonna get me? What do you spend on your tack, like on your feed? Uh, like you can get your horse shoed once, maybe if it has special <laughs> shoes, you need to throw in another twenty five bucks. Like, mm -hmm. Come on, yeah, yeah that, that is a joke. Yeah, yeah, and we don't want that. We don't want to be seen any more as a joke than we already have been. It's not, it, no, it doesn't make you see it as a joke. What it does is it uses black riders. That yeah. to me is a, is a using them as a cover to show we're doing something. That we should have done all along, but we're still not. I am that that is that is using those riders. I, I really yeah, yeah, and I guarantee you, I guarantee freaking T you, I don't know what the the composition of the application was, yeah. but I guarantee you we will see some of it. We will see, you know, the picture that they had to submit and they say, Why do you deserve this scholarship? Mm -hmm. And you know, using it as a quote in some freaking advertisement or something. Well, like uh, you, you're not on USCF. I wonder if I could share screen. Can I share screen while I? Yeah, hold on. Let me make sure that it's allowed for everybody. I, maybe you don't need to. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can share it. Let me see. I'm going to find. Give me a minute. Chat amongst yourselves while I. But this yeah. Is a conversation. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, like, as you brought it up, because when I saw it, like, I was like, Caitlin, look at this. Well, I Dallas. <laughs> Probably just like that. That's how it's like, look, it got me. I was so psyched. Exactly. Like, that would have been amazing to just to see someone win that five thousand, like five thousand dollars. Oh, host disabled screen sharing. You gotta give me share screen. Um, oh, just kidding. There you go. I think I could buy like five books with two hundred dollars. That's how much those books cost. They're expensive. Wow. Hold on, share screen. Let's see, what was it? Sorry, am I am I ruining everyone's life here? No, you're oh, fine. no. I have to like cool down sometimes. Let me get yeah. Okay, <laughs> can you see my screen now? Um, no. Hopefully, oh. hopefully it allows you to share while we're on Facebook Live. Hmm. I don't think I wouldn't. I don't know. I'm not high tech enough. Share screen. Okay, and then I go to Firefox. Okay, open system, print. open. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> no, a granny. I can't do it. Um, but yeah, it's and and for those people that did win, you know, it, it's not like knocking what you were afforded. Like, I don't want anybody to be like upset with us, but right. I more. Oh, I figured it out. Okay. Yeah, they deserve they, more than that. That's the thing, but they, they did get this and they do deserve it, but they deserve okay. more. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes. This is the United States Equestrian Federation that has not made nary a peep about uh, what to do about becoming more inclusive, except to put the young woman on their home screen is now black. And if that's not, you know, unfair tokenism, I, I don't know what is. Yeah. No, uh, like, uh, so, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I can't even articulate because I, I get frustrated. You know, they have not stepped up. They have not done anything like what U.S. eventing is pretending to do. Um, they haven't made a statement about inclusivity. They haven't added unconscious bias training into safe sport. Do you, do you have to take safe sport? Uh, training, which is um, about uh, uh, sexual abuse. Um, you have to, every Olympic sport has to have uh, 
every year you have to have a training. They have it included unconscious bias training in it. And yet, what do they do? They make their home screen a black person, you know, yeah. and it, it's a cover. Yeah, yeah. And, and that we talked about this in one of our panels that we did, like, you can't, tell me that there's no way like how do we know who's racist how do we you know penalize these people who talk out the side of their neck at shows and stuff how like you could do it with sexual assault you could do it with sexual harassment sexual abuse what do you mean you can't do it with with racism and discriminatory practices. We have to assume that everyone at baseline is unconsciously racist. Mm -hmm. And then we have to engage everyone with the tools to make them better. Putting a black person on the United States Equestrian Federation website, giving $200 to a handful of deserving black people is not that. Mm -mm. It's not work. And that doesn't require any work for anyone you know that doesn't require i just i just don't like the handout situation it doesn't require any introspection or any culpability or any thought you know reading did you even read the applications if you were going to just give everybody money did you even read did you take the time to hear their story Mm -hmm. at all Mm -hmm. and it's like we scape we scrape together additional money to provide funds for all 27 people why i'm not balling you know five thousand dollars for a scholarship that undoubtedly went to seven 27 people that's yeah. not a lot of money right no, i bet like five thousand dollars will get one rider into several horse shows that they couldn't otherwise access and get them on the platform. You know, like we're saying with Larry's brother, uh, Larry's cousin, we'll, we'll get them into the competition so they can compete. $200 right. keeps we'll you right where you that. are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and at a show, like the show managers, the show owners, runners, whoever, they can make more than that at one single show. But you know what? We're actually missing the point. It's not about scholarships. Even if it was a good, uh, well-funded scholarship, Mm -hmm. it is not doing the work. It's PR. Because look what happened here in this conversation. I said, ooh, yay, the work's being done. And then I just, you informed me, and I realized it's absolutely not. You know, Mm -hmm. we need to have a a, a tremendous amount of self-exploration because we do it in the horse world, and we'll take it to the rest of the world. Because this is a problem... You know that goes far deeper. Uh, you weren't here for this part of the conversation, Caitlin, but when I worked at a horse ranch, I found some old historical flyers for it, and on the bottom it said, "The clientele is reserved to Gentiles only." You know, to, to no Jews allowed. And here is this Jew working there. And we need to look back and look at those explicit uh, uh, exclusion orders. For, for all sorts of people and then find out where they're still implicit and erase them completely. But pretending that that stamp never existed is not the way to fix this. Right, right, 100%. All I can think about is that guy in our YBE group who went out to his competition for the mounted shooting and he paid to participate in, um, oh, Ariana helped me with my memory. He said what they wouldn't, he won, but there was like something weird with the check or. Yeah. And they didn't give him the money that he had, that he would, that he should have been awarded. Um, And then they didn't call, I think when it was his turn, like everybody else, they read their biography and stuff about them. And when it was his turn, nobody did it. And he was there with his family and he didn't have anyone else to say, you know, speak up and vouch for him. Cause I feel like had he done that, they would have probably just been like, well, that's just how we do things. You know well, what I mean? If my check bounce is at a horse show, they call me on the phone and say, ah, Sarah, your check bounce, can you get a credit card? You know? Mm-hmm. And that's white privilege right there. Yeah. Yeah, but he he didn't get his winnings. Yeah, for, um, for he, competing. He was just saying that he had been in con, or he was trying to contact the show office and was like getting the runaround. And it's like, really? Yeah. Right. You know, it's not about the money. He could afford to be there. Uh, yeah. 
It's about the treatment that he received while he was there. And he did not feel like it was a place that would be welcome for him. And not only that, he brought his family with him. So he's got to be on his ride, worrying about whether or not somebody's messing with his family because it's not a place that either of them feel feel welcome in, in being. My high school, I went to this super posh, like all girls private school, and it's having a really big moment of reckoning with this stuff. It's called the Brearley School. And there was an Instagram account created called Black at Brearley. And it's about all of like these quiet, hideous things that these girls experience. That as a white person, I, I really floated above it. I had no idea what were happening. And now I, I think about it, and of course, and um, to, to what you're saying about exclusion, uh, one girl said they were reading something in uh, literature class about um, being an outsider. And the teacher turned to her and said, oh, you can speak about um, what it feels like to be an outsider, talk, talk about that. And the girl was like, how am I an outsider? Mm-hmm. And th- till that minute, the girl was a burly girl, just like all her classmates. But the teacher saw her as not belonging there because she had black skin, she's the outsider. You know, and, and that is the, the quiet stuff, because we can talk about slavery, we can talk about past injustice, we can talk about segregation, and then the answer will be from many people, but that's the past, we're better than that, we're inclusive now. But that that implicit quiet stuff that happens in a classroom, that happens in a riding ring, that's mm-hmm. where it stays dangerous. Mm-hmm. And we have to be aware, and, and, and we have to recognize that we're not aware. Yeah, yeah, yep. I yep. completely agree. It's the loud people that draw attention to themselves and I'm like, like AERC, one of their, um, like their board members, board directors, whatever they got over there, um, had like a half sheet or some kind of blanket that said Trump make a gr- make America great again. And then had it like hanging on our truck. Mm-hmm. I had, had another one, like just had a poster or like a flag hanging on our truck. And it's like, okay, but apparently there were some issues with people saying Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. You just gonna- Oh, that's okay. interesting oh. that the, the two political cam- campaigns, yeah, as a journalist, I'm not able to speak about my political leanings, but it is interesting right. that certain uh, banners were banned from horse shows and others weren't. That, that is really interesting. Yeah, wow. yeah. So that was kind of the uproar maybe like two days ago, like- I thought you were gonna say a Confederate flag. Um, I was about to say that they, every, people have been upset about banning that too. Yeah, in in Mississippi and Alabama and all those southern states, you see it in the rodeo ring. And I know people, you know, they want their kids or they want to participate, but I'm just like, if y'all see that, you need to tell them you're not running until they take it down. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. Really? That's NASCAR. I mean, really blew my mind that they. They st- I mean, maybe hopefully things will follow NASCAR because yeah. they're kind of a cultural bastion to, yeah. to change. Yeah. Wow, interesting. It was interesting just to see all this unfold. <laughs> um, yeah. It seemed like it happened really fast just because of all the events that led up to this and then the pandemic. But I mean, I guess like the ball was kind of running, rolling already. It was just slow and then it was like, okay, but let's get that. <laughs> we're not doing anything else. Yeah. <laughs> all in front. But that, yeah, everybody's everybody's at home just yep. doing this. But you know, George Floyd, his death, his murder was on video. And if Emmett Till's murder had been on video, we might have done this decades ago, mm-hmm. you know. And 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 many others. I just I think it was partially that you can't turn away from what happened there. You can turn away from a Confederate flag, you know, but you can't turn away. Uh, from that. But my friend Musa, who's actually doing a, a book talk with me about Black Cowboys um, on the 7th, we're doing a Zoom talk, so maybe you want to share it with your community. Yeah. Um, he's, he writes about race, um, he's one of my best friends, and uh, race in sport, in football, or soccer. He's British, so he's a, a soccer commentator. And he said um, that the most dangerous racists are the quiet ones. Mm-hmm. He doesn't care about a loud racist. Because uh-huh. you know your enemy, you can walk, you can skirt around them, right? You can avoid that stall with the Confederate flag on it. Yes, yes. But the dangerous yes. racists are the quiet ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree. And you know what? It's so not horses. Like, just bring it back to horses. Like, 
Monty Roberts, the horse whisperer said to me, the horses care about one thing and one thing only. Are you a safe place to be? Mm -hmm. And it's just so strange to me that this sport that is about something so pure got wrapped up in culture divides and elite and us and them um, because horses just aren't like that. Maybe, you know, tennis rackets and tennis might be, you know, but horses got caught up in some cultural bullshit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me see what my other questions are. We're hitting an hour. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so are what are you most looking forward to after your book release? What am I most looking forward to after my book release? Talking to people, you know, it's so uh, disappointing to have had my book tour canceled by COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so these ways to engage, I mean, like I feel like I've learned in this conversation, I, I hope you've learned about a crazy <laughs> semen smuggling uh, biatch, um, you know, so uh, really these conversations, like it comes out Wednesday, people are starting to get them already in the mail. People have sent me and it's just like, I have a knot in my stomach thinking about like, people are gonna read my stuff and we're gonna be able to talk about it and learn from each other. And, you know, I'm a journalist. Like my life is about uh, learning from other people and engaging with them. Um, and, you know, pandemic lockdown, I was in this apartment sick with coronavirus for 24 days. Uh, and uh, for someone built like me, you know, that was living hell. Just one of my people mm -hmm. and my people being all people. <laughs> so I'm really excited to talk about the book and hear what people think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you are healthy and, and still yeah. with us. <laughs> 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 well, thank you so much. I'm looking, I forgot that like people could comment on this. So I was <laughs> Manny I a great comment. Yes, yes. Manny said, I think it's important. Manny's my neighbor, by the way. Hi, Manny. I think it's important to not just announce that you have a scholarship, but be transparent and highlight your game plan and desired outcome. Yeah. Transparency, transparency shows true intent. More reasons for minorities to come together and build our own charities and scholarships, even if it's for areas of interest that we do not take part in. Manny, good. I know, just dropping truth, truth on us right there. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that is kind of why we started this podcast and why we kind of stick our fingers in the places that we do. Like huh? <laughs> I said that people don't like us too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you have some of these like like after or once the push for diversity in the horse world started you got all these accounts and these people popping up and they're like yes I've been talking about diversity my whole life it's like girl there were no black people on your page until June <laughs> like <laughs> right me. look as, as, <laughs> as someone whose Instagram feed is full of suddenly woke horse girls like let's <laughs> Take it where we can get it, you know? Like, take it. Where I had the good fortune of running into Dr. Blair when I was 20. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known anything about the black cowboy because the world is a segregated still by socioeconomic, uh, I won't say order, disorder um, that didn't allow me to overlap with that story, you know? So to me, I, I, I welcome people where they're at as long as they don't think posting on Instagram uh, is the work. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And, and that's kind of where I was going with that. Like mm -hmm. that, that seems to be it, you know? And I, I just think that I'm just so excited kind of for what everything that we've been doing and and I'm not gonna lie like it is some validation like for the past year just bringing together these stories and talking to these people and like I, I grew up like wanting to work with animals and that's it like animals people are gross like that's kind of the moniker of the veterinary <laughs> profession but I'm actually enjoying hearing these stories um, because it's something that we are so completely passionate about. So thank you, you so much for, for including that in your I, book. I, but it's, our, it's all of our story. And, and please, I appreciate you saying thank you, but, but don't, you know, I, I think the, the books that don't have it are failing. This isn't an added plus. This isn't a 
a, a, a treat for white people to have a, a little extra something in their book. You know, this is part of the story. One in four cowboys in the American West were black. One in four people in our American origin story were erased from it. And, you know, that continues. Um, that continues with a $200 crap scholarship, you know, and um, it's, look, you, you were woke before it was cool, you know, with your, <laughs> your podcast, you know, you, you, were, you were doing the work. Um, but uh, I think it's up to people like you to, to, to shine a light, to hold a light up, and you're a beacon. So that's really why I wanted to join you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, gosh. So Manny is from New York. He says, sign my book. Thanks. <laughs> he just ordered the book. Yes. <laughs> I'll so send we'll, his address. I'll send him a book plate. Yes, yes, yes. yes. His book. We'll do that. We'll do that. Well, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. We are going to put this on our YouTube channel, too, because I do not want it to go away forever. And ever. <laughs> People need to hear about this. And yes. they need to listen okay. to it a few times. I might drop yeah. it in his inbox. <laughs> awesome. well, everybody watching, let us know what you thought about this whole conversation. If you have any questions for Sarah, Sarah, tell us where we can find you. Or where uh, else we can find you. You can find my book that goes on sale on Wednesday on the 4th, but you can pre-order it now on anywhere that anywhere the books are sold. It's a great website called Indie Bound, which uh, you put in your zip code and you can buy from a local bookstore. So can fight the Amazon monster, um, but you can buy this anywhere. Um, and uh, you can find me on Instagram at horse crazy the book. That's the account, one word. And uh, I answer DMs and I'll answer questions and I don't know, hit me up, I'll send you a signed copy. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much and you have a great rest of your night. You too, thanks guys. And stay safe in that hurricane. <laughs> thank you, bye. bye.